read some of the opinions today. Um, yeah. Morning. 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 How's everybody doing? We're hanging in there. <laughs> Yeah, we can open with prayer. I know um, Pakistan has a lot of flooding. There was a horrendous event in India yesterday where a few hundred people, or over a hundred people at this point, have passed away from a sort of like a stampede. Stampede, yeah. a doctor yeah. being. Yeah. Oh, I didn't hear that last part. From what? A stampede at a soccer game. There was just oh, yeah. like everybody just trying to escape and a bunch of people were trampled, like over 100 people were trampled. I guess they were upset by the outcome of the game. Yeah, that's what started at the church, but the uh, mm. people supporting the team. Mm -hmm. Well, they were fleeing from the tear gas. Yeah, there was tear gas in Indonesia. Yeah, it was. Um, yeah, so we can and New Orleans. And New Orleans too? Mm -hmm. I don't know how much down. I don't know about New Orleans. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's okay. I can pray. Holy One, thank you for bringing us together today. We ask your protection and, and healing hand over our world. You know, it's broken in, in various places. Um, we ask that you would give comfort and, and strength to those. Um, who are hurting. We thank you for Amanda and the lesson she's going to bring us today. And we ask for clarity of thought and just a good discussion all around. Um, we give you thanks for all that in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm. Oh. Okay, we have everything. All right, so Amos. Does anyone know uh anyone know anything about Amos? Curious. Sorry. That's all we're here to listen. You do. A <laughs> minor <laughs> problem. Yeah. Perfect. Wonderful. Absolutely right. So, um, so that was the last week we talked about Joel. Yes. So, you know, Julie was saying last week, don't know a lot about Joel, don't have a lot of information. We have a little more information about Amos, um, some things that can very specifically tie him to a, a time and a place. Um, we don't have a ton of information, but we definitely have more than previously. Amos is also just kind of a um, very vivid imagery um, as you read through it. Um, and if you haven't, I, I just encourage you to and to, re and to read really all of the minor prophets. They're just also compact. Um, even if you don't understand everything, it's um, this the literary style of, of the minor prophets is, is very interesting. Amos in particular, um, I apparently liked it so much that I wrote a paper about it. So um, I couldn't tell you why I chose Amos, but I, I did. So um, so let's- uh, She kept saying she was gonna read it to you guys. And I was like, no, I've <laughs> <laughs> gotta cover two Sundays, like. <laughs> Uh, it's, 20, it's a 20 page paper so um yeah. just read it real slow uh, yeah. so um let's let's dive in so who was amos would anyone like to read amos 1 verse 1 
it's really short. Mm -hmm. I'll read it. All right, go ahead. The words of Amos, one of the shepherds of Tekoa, what he saw concerning Israel two years before the earthquake, when Uzzah was king of Judah and Jerome, son of Joah, was king of Israel. Perfect. So there you go. That's Amos right there. Um, so just in that brief introduction, we learn um, quite a bit about Amos, about who he was, where he was from, um, and when he was called to, to speak. So um, Amos was among the shepherds of Tekoa. So Tekoa uh, is in the Southern Kingdom, and that is just uh, about 10 miles or so south of Bethlehem. Um, he was a shepherd, um, which is interesting. The word that's used here for shepherd is different than um, the than, yes, the, the normal word for shepherd. So it may have indicated that he um, was an owner of flocks. Um, if we look at chapter seven, verse 14, we get a little bit more insight into kind of um, who Amos was. Um, and we'll look more at this particular incident where Amos is speaking in the, the background around it. But um, in, chapter, in chapter seven, 14, it says, then Amos answered Amaziah, I am no prophet nor a prophet's son, but I am a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore trees. So, um, tree surgeon. <laughs> <laughs> Something to that uh, to that effect. So, um, and anyone ever hear that before? Uh, there's a couple of different somebody trans somebody's translations say say something different than uh, dresser of sycamore trees. No. No. Mine says took care of sycamore fig tree. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Sycamore fig. Uh -huh. See, I wondered if it was the same kind of sycamore trees as we have in North America. Yeah. But apparently it's different. Huh. Yeah. 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 So um so he took care of, of fig trees. Um the the language that's used here, there's there's a lot of debate about it, but um well, so he was a dresser, he was a, a carer of sycamore trees, or uh, what's called, um, he would pierce the fruit. So he would pierce the fruit to ensure that it was ripe. Um, but all of this kind of indicating that he was more than just a, your typical shepherd. He was maybe a small farmer, uh, you know, a farmer, so he owned some land. Um, and he took care of the, the sycamore trees and some fig trees. Um, and also had some livestock to to some degree. So that's kind of who Amos was. Um, and when in chapter seven, when he says, I'm not a prophet nor a son of a prophet, um, that's important in the sense that Amos is identifying himself. He's not denying that he's been called to speak, that he's essentially taking a prophetic role, but he's what he's, a lot of scholars think that he's, uh, pushing towards is to say, you know, I'm not part of what's called the the prophetic guild. Does anyone know what that is? No. So in during this time, um, there was uh, when you were called, you could be part of what's called a prophetic guild. So it was kind of this class of people who were called to be prophets. Um, so essentially, he's saying, you know, I'm not part of this this old school what people consider to be prophets. Um, I'm, I've been called, you know, to, by God, I have a message to say, I'm going to say my message. And then we're pretty sure once he delivers his message, he just goes back, back home to being a farmer. Um, so that's the distinction that he's making there. Um, he's not a part of this, this kind of it's class. Not trade. Yeah, it's not his trade. Um, so that's who Amos was. Um, when did he when was he called to deliver God's message? So this- um, Two years before the earthquake. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> he knew it was coming. <laughs> That's right there. <laughs> so we knew, um, so it says, you know, it, 
this this first verse is probably added at, at a later time to give context to the words of Amos. Mm -hmm. um, and so the earthquake that he's talking about um, is very specific. Um, we don't really have a, a specific date for the earthquake, but we know that he prophesied during the reign of King Jeroboam II in Israel um, and during the reign of King Isaiah in the southern kingdom, in the kingdom of Judah. So what we do know, and there's a reference to this in, in Amos chapter 8, um, we don't know when there was an earthquake, but we know that there is an account of an eclipse. And in Amos chapter 8, um, Amos talks about the sun standing still. And so um, that's how we, a lot of scholars um, postulate that, okay, there was probably, you know, we know when the eclipse was, so probably with the eclipse, there was an earthquake, even though that's not documented. So the date of the eclipse is June 15th, 763 BC. So if we say that he prophesied two years before that, so it was right around 760. Um, so that's our that's our time frame for good old Amos. So it makes it makes it real real easy for us. Um, and and most scholars agree about that that time. Um, so we know who Amos was when he was called. Um, and what was he called to do? What was the situation um, that Amos was called to speak into? So um, during Amos's, uh, during this time, uh, Amos is from the Southern Kingdom and he's called to deliver message to, to Israel, to the Northern Kingdom, the, the house of Jacob. Um, and during this time, um, where Amos was called to speak. It was a very prosperous time for Israel. It was a time of peace, um, prosperity, security. Um, the, the rich were getting richer and the poor were getting poorer. Um, I don't know if that sounds familiar to anyone, um, but he was called to, to speak into this, um, into this moment in time and to, the, to Israelites to, to give them a clear warning about their actions. Amos is focused on justice. Um, and we'll see that as we we look further into him um, and and what he what he's calling the people to do. So Amos uh, can kind of be divided up pretty simply. There's nine chapters in Amos. Uh, chapters one and two um, address um, the um, Amos is kind of uh, calling into account the neighbors of, of Israel. And so it's kind of, uh, it's his, his uh, oracles against the nations. Some of your, your Bibles might have like a, a title that says something to that effect. Um, so he's calling into account the actions of the Is Israelites neighbors saying, these are things that you did and these are the consequences for your action. All of that to build up to call into account um, the actions of the Israelites. So in chapters three through six, we see the oracles against the nation of Israel itself. Um, and then in the latter half of, of Amos, he moves on to uh, the, the five visions. So we're going to look at chapter seven through nine next week, but this week we're going to focus on these, these beginning oracles. There's a lot of interesting um, literary styles in Amos, and we're going to unpack those a little bit more um, today in the, the first part. Um, different uh, theories as to certain, you know, certain sections, when they were added, were they truly the voice of Amos, or were they added at a later date? Um, what we know about about the Bible, how things were compiled, you know, this this was not a literary society. It was a it was an oral society. So things were compiled together. Um, there are some some of the oracles that are seen to be perhaps added at a later date. That doesn't lend them as less of the words of Amos, even though they may not have been spoken specifically by him, because the spirit of them still coincides with the message of Amos, mm -hmm. and the message of Amos is what he was given by God. Um, 
So that's just important to remember, um, whatever the, the case may be, whatever scholars say, or um, there's even one scholar who postulates that the entire book of Amos was done in a 30 minute, um, just a 30 minute proclamation. He said all this stuff and just packed up his stuff and went home, which I think while interesting is highly unlikely, but you know, they, they uh, it, I guess it could be done. It's pretty, it's pretty concise, but that's a lot to kind of throw out all at once. Um, so let's go ahead and um, uh, we were just going to do snippets of the first and second chapter because um, it's a lot of repetitive. So one, three, and four. I can read that. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Damascus, and for four I will not revoke the punishment, because they have threshed Gilead with threshing sledges of iron. So I will send a fire on the house of Hazael, and it shall devour the strongholds of Ben Hadad. And then he goes on to say other things about Damascus. <laughs> yeah, I'm just finishing. I will break the gate, the gate bars of Damascus and cut off the inhabitants from the valley of the Ben. And the one who holds a scepter from Beth Eden and the people of Aram shall go into the shall go into exile to Kir, says the Lord. Hmm? Six to seven. Does anyone want to read the, the next section? Thus says the Lord for three transgressions of Gaza, and for four, I will not revoke the punishment, but to be carried into exile, entire communities to hand them over to Edom. So I will send a fire on the wall of Gaza, fire that shall devour its stronghold. You just want to, you can finish. Sorry, eight. through eight. <laughs> oh, I will cut off the inhabitants from Ashdod and the one who holds the scepter from Ashkelon. I will turn my hand against Ekron, and the remnant of the Philistines shall perish, says the Lord God. So does anyone see a pattern? <laughs> I, 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 I'm sure I've been taught this, but I never remember when they, they say the, the three and then the four. Um, I, I, that always, I always wonder if it's a poetic, if it's a, a way to, to remember for, to get people's attention, or if, if they're talking again of the miraculous seven days of creation, I mean, it, all, all that comes to mind. It, 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 it sets up a rhythm. Mm -hmm. And um, I yeah. just wonder about that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, no, you're you're 100 percent correct. It's this is a this is a, a literary tool tool okay. or an oratory tool, um, and uh, you kind of dinged all 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 of the things. Um, some uh, some scholars say that this is uh, rem reminiscent of a style um, similar to the Egyptian execration texts. Um, so it's. It's also, this is a very common Old Testament technique where you give a number and then you give the number plus one. Um, but it's also, this is unique. Again, some scholars say, well, this is unique because it says for, for, three, for three sins for four, um, it does call into you know, the, the number seven. You, know, you have a very specific number and the number seven is in perfection. Um, so uh, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a part of it as well. Um, Anything else? Is any um, any other patterns, or if you kind of, I don't know if anyone read a little bit more. Um, um, well, back in verse two, it says the Lord roars from Zion, yeah. and this seems like it's all the action of this roaring, <laughs> different ways to roar. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely, uh, and this kind of harkens back to the end of Joel as well. Um, but we'll see this, uh, essentially this roar um, uh, of, of the lion of, of Zion come out again in Amos as well. But it is absolutely kind of, you know, at this point, God is expressing his, his deep 
um, deep anger and frustration at, uh, at how the people have been, been acting. Um, but, but Damascus is the powerful ally to the north, right? Is there, am I getting it? Am I remembering my geography? First of all, uh, I mean, since they're always yes. about either between the north and the south, yeah, they have allied with the north. Mm -hmm. Syria has not treated them well. I'm looking at my maps. <laughs> yeah, yes. Yeah, uh, and some of these other places sound to me like they are um, part of the southern kingdom. You know, you come comes to yeah. Some of them might be later editions, like nine or Tyre. Yeah, Edom. Yeah. So. Um, it's like you're sitting there prosperous thinking you've done well to align yourselves with the powerful. You're wrong. I can break the powerful. I mean, I just, it, it's sort of like they're sitting there thinking, well, we weren't the bad guys. So you're going everything's get... so good right now. There's peace, prosperity. Yeah. Yeah. What's the problem? Yeah. 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 I just and everything's going good and so but you know Amos in these first two chapters he's talking about and these really are their neighbors um I maybe should have done a map for, but um you know and he's caught you know he's calling to account all of these neighboring nations who also kind of experience this time of of prosperity but um but the Israelites probably wouldn't have had too much um, problem with hearing these bad things about their neighbors. So this, these first two chapters are like, okay, cool. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So they get some judgment. Um, but when we get on to chapter two, verse four, things start to change a little bit. And so the Israelites at this point too, are still probably not too, uh, too upset about what's happening. Okay. Yeah. All these, yeah, the, the Ammonites, oh, yeah, they're bad. Go ahead and punish. Oh, Moab, yep, okay, good. Um, so uh, chapter two, verse four and five, anyone like to read that? Thus says the Lord for three transgressions of Judah, and for four I will not invoke the punishment, because they have rejected the um, law of the Lord and have not kept the statute. But they have been led astray by the same lies after which their ancestors walked. So I will send a fire on Judah, and it will devour, devour the stronghold of Jerusalem. Okay, so now we're getting a little closer. Now we're talking about Judah. So still okay, because it's not Israel. But, um, and, and the interesting, you know, the, the judgment that's called on the other nations, it's still, it's pretty harsh. Um, you know, God says, I'm going to send a fire on Moab. It's gonna, Moab is going to devour the strongholds. Um, Moab shall die amid uproar, amid shouting, and the sound of trumpet. I will cut off the ruler from its midst, and I will kill all its officials with him. But then we kind of see this change um, when we're talking about the people of God, the children of God, the nation that God has called um, for three transgressions of Judah for four, I will not revoke the punishment because they have rejected the law of the Lord and not kept his statutes. They have been led away by the stream, the, by the same lies after which their ancestors walked. So I will send fire on Judah and it shall devour the strongholds of Jerusalem. So now we're seeing kind of a shift in here's these nations that did not have a special calling or a special relationship, but now we see something different. So um, would anyone like to read chap, uh, verses six through? I said so, six, but we can go six through eight. Seven. Down in the whole sentence. Uh, six and seven. Oh, it is the middle. Yeah, read through eight. Six through eight. Thus says the Lord, for three trans transgressions of Israel, and for four, I will revoke the punishment, because they sell the righteous for silver, and the needy for a pair of sandals. They who trample the head of the poor 
end to the dust of the earth and push the afflicted out of the way. Father and son go into the same girl so that my only name is profane. They lay themselves down besides every altar on garments taken in pledge. And in the house of their Lord and in the house of their God, they drink. They drink wine brought with fines they imposed. Okay. So what do we think about this? What are some thoughts about some of the, the previous oracles against the nations and some and now what what we're hearing about Israel? Don't be shy. <laughs> Greed, selfishness, and lascivious. <clears throat> Make Israel great again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They're not exempt. They're not exempt. They're not exempt. They know. They know that God requires justice and the right relationship with each other and with God. They know that. Yeah. So, like I said, you know, the Israelites were probably thinking, okay, that's good. That's good for, for Ammon. That's good for Moab. Um, that's good for Judah. But now Amos is saying, oh, but wait. And it it starts to dig. It, it, gets, it gets very specific into what, what is going on and to the people that that Amos is speaking to it's gonna it's gonna start pushing those buttons to get their attention um you know these are as as harsh and as vivid as the previous indictments against the other nations are these I think for me kind of uh you know you draw you know they who trample the head of the poor into the dust that and push the afflicted out of the way father and son go to into, into the same girl so that my holy name is profa profane and those are some pretty uh, pretty specific mm -hmm. images um so oh, yeah, so the needy for a pair of shoes. Yeah. I'm so sorry if I missed this, but um, for four and five, is this the southern kingdom of Judah? And for six through eight, is this the northern kingdom of Israel? Yes. Or the all of Israel? Is for, so four and five is specifically the southern kingdom. Okay. And then six through eight is specifically looking at the northern kingdom. Okay. Yeah, so <laughs> drawing a distinction between the two. So Judah's not too bad. They're just not following the law of the Lord. They're just forgetting. But Israel, they're real bad. They're like a, Ooh, above and beyond. That's how they got destroyed first. <laughs> I mean, they're yeah, real that's, bad. What, that's what I'm saying is like, is Amos from, Ju I'm sorry if you said this already too. Is Amos from Judah or Israel? Yeah, he's from the Southern He's from Judah. Judah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So it's interesting. There is some context, some probably some uh, bias going mm -hmm. on here as well as much as we like to think you know this is the word of the lord but it sounds like there might be some biases going on too like there's two two verses on judah and then it continues on israel those first three we read aren't all it right no no it, it continues so going. yeah i mean i know they're destroyed first but still it's uh i think it's important to acknowledge right like it's pointing the finger definitely as well not just on the other nations but his neighboring people which is really interesting and hard but um okay thank you <laughs> did i miss something no you did not okay um would anyone like to read uh verse 12 to 16 the end of chapter two okay. But she made the Nazareth strength warning and commanded the prophets, saying, 
should not talk with him. So I will press him down on this place, just as a cart presses down when it is full of cheese. Flight shall perish from the swift, and the strong shall not retain their strength, nor shall the mighty save their power. Those who handle the bow shall not stand, and those who are swift of foot shall not save themselves, nor shall those who write to save their lives. And those who are stout of heart among the mighty shall flee away naked. So nobody escapes. Nobody escapes, yeah. Remember I talked about the very vivid imagery of Amos. Um, so it, the, the Nazarites, if you're not familiar, were called to make a specific a special vow to the Lord and were not to to drink. Um, and so this that's the stark contrast that that the first verse, verse 12 is, but you made the Nazarites drink wine and commanded the prophets, you shall not prophesy. As we know, prophets um, speak the word of God. But um, so I'll just, I'll read you a little portion of my paper here. Um, so Israel's sin is as severe as that of the other nations. Though they've not ripped open the wombs of pregnant women, they have severely oppressed the poor. They've used the poor to support their vulgar and licentious living, to support their religious prostitution. They are ungrateful, yet the Lord has been gracious to them in bringing them out of Egypt and delivering the Amorites into their hands. What is more, they've rejected the truth by breaking the vow of the Nazarites and silencing the prophets. Mm -hmm. This very vivid imagery of the Lord literally pressing the people down. This is the result of the judgment. I'm sorry, the result of this judgment does not leave room for hope. It is a very bleak pronouncement seeming to indicate that all will experience the Lord's wrath. So Amos is beginning to, to build a pretty strong case uh, against Israel. So, and again, it's important to remember, you know, this, this is a time of prosperity. This is a time where they think it's not, and it's not just a time of prosperity. It's a time of, um, of religious prosperity or, or spiritual prosperity as well. Um, and that's kind of what these, these, these next oracles are really going to kind of hone in on to a degree. Um, so this is, uh, in the next few chapters, we're going to look at, um, in, here in, uh, Amos chapter three, verse two. Um, this is, this is kind of key to, to what Amos is honing in on. And so this is what, uh, you know, he's the, using the voice of the Lord. You only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. The word that he uses here for, and he's talking about the, the Israelites. He's talking about the people of Jacob. You only have I known that word there, yada, that's used as a very intimate way of knowing. It's the same way that Adam, yada, Eve. That's how it's used in 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 Genesis and throughout the, the Old Testament. So this very, very uh, intimate knowledge is calling to the fact that the, these are the people that have a covenant relationship mm -hmm. with God and they have specific responsibilities. Um, and then later on in, in these next verses, you know, it, it calls into, again, we hear does a lion roar in the forest when it has no prey? Does a lion cry out from its den if it has caught nothing? And so we're seeing again the imagery of, of the lion that's called forth. Um, so uh, would anyone like to read? I think this is 12. Would anyone like to read uh, 9 through 15? In 3 or in three. Chapter, yeah. Proclaim to the strongholds in Ashdod and to the strongholds in the land of Egypt and say, assemble yourselves, I'm known. Samaria and see what great tumults are within it. 
and what oppressions are in its midst. They do not know how to do right, says the Lord. Those who store up violence and robbery in their strongholds. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, an adversary shall surround the land and strip you of your defense, and your strongholds shall be plundered. The 12 as well? Yeah, through the end of the chapter. Yeah. Oh, okay. Thus says the Lord, as the shepherds recuse rescue from the mouth of the lion two legs or a piece of an ear, so shall the people of Israel who live in Samaria be rescued with the corner of a couch and part of a bed. Seems very strange. <laughs> Hear and testify against the house of Jacob, says the Lord God and the God of hosts. On the day I punish Israel for its transgressions, I will punish the altars of Bethel, and the horns of the altars shall be cut off and fall to the ground. I will tear down the winter house as well as the summer house, and the houses of ivory shall perish, and the great houses shall come to an end says the Lord. So what's interesting in, in, in these verses, um, calling again, you know, this consequences to, um, to breaking the covenant. Um, there's kind of a, there's kind of a hint of maybe a remnant um, in verse 12. But it's very odd because it's talking about a piece, uh, two legs or a piece of an ear. And yeah. so for a shepherd to say you're going to save the, you know, that doesn't really sound like much of a, a of a. The goal. Yeah. Um, so it could be, so it, whatever the, there, there may be a remnant, but it's, the cost is very severe of what that's going to look like. Um, and again, just the images of the, the prosperity there. I'm going to destroy your winter houses, your summer houses, your house of ivory. It's all going to be gone. Um, so in chapter four, um, are there any, any notes about house of ivory? I mean, that sounds opulent. I mean, ivory is always a price commodity. I think it's just the wealthy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We'll just, people, okay. just calling into account, you know, you think that you think that you're safe because, and you think that God is blessing you because mm -hmm. you have all of this prosperity. Mm -hmm. But I'm here to give you a different message. Um, in chapter two, this chapter seems to be indicating that that your prosperity has come from that that oppression. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not not. Blessings for your goodness, you have stolen mm. and oppressed to get this prosperity. Yes, yes. Your prosperity has come from from oppression. I don't know if the the Zoomers heard that, but so what you have what you have gained is because of what you have taken from those who are less fortunate. Um, so in this next uh, this next piece in chapter four. Um, Amos is addressing the the women of Bashan. So the women of Bashan. Um, <coughs> I love this passage. Um, they're you know very well to do ladies. I don't know. Think of like the the Real, housewife Real Housewives of, of Atlanta, or Real Housewives <laughs> of Bashan. Um, yeah. um, Okay. I'll just read it. Uh, Hear this word, you cows of Bashan, who are on Mount Samaria, who oppress the poor, who crush the needy, who say to their husband, bring something to drink. The Lord God has sworn by his holiness, the time is surely coming upon you when they shall take you away with hooks, even the last of you with fish hooks. Through breaches in the wall you shall leave, each one straight ahead, and you shall be flung out into Harmon, says the Lord. Some 
pretty harsh words there that um so the first part of that for me invokes that image as kind of a you know the real housewives of Bashan. Um but the second part of it, what do you think about the second part? Um in verse the, the end of verse two there. Take your way with folks. Mm -hmm. That part? You're still saying that we're going to come emphasizing horror movies where you share my complex if you imagine these people being pulled out with hooks through these holes and all oh, and cast into something sort of a very horrific point of view. Yeah. That's what is Harmon? You shall be flung out into Harmon at the end of verse three. That is an excellent question, and no one really knows. It's kind of an untranslatable. They just uh, kind of so were like, well, this was what we think is the best thing. They're not. Yeah. Yeah. So that's like harm. I yes. Mean, just, you know, it's not good. Yeah. It's the worst you can imagine. Right. Uncertain. And even the uncertainty mm -hmm. is scary. Oh, I see. I'm like, oh, no, uncertain. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's that the kind of horrific image of being being led away with hooks. What's What's interesting is when the Israelites are eventually um, taken into captivity by the Assyrians. What we know is how they. Um, one of the ways that they subjugated the people that they they captured was to lead them away with hooks mm -hmm. so this is this is a very vivid um very vivid imagery about what is going to happen but at that you know you have to put your place put yourself in in the the place of the you know the the ladies of Bashan the people of Israel this is not even something that that they can can even fully comprehend at this point because Everything's just going so well. So you don't think there might be a historical time when books were used so they would understand what that is meaning, you know, that those books could come back. <laughs> I mean, no, I think they I think that it's you know, it's something that I just think that they they probably just didn't even imagine that that could happen to them. You know, I think that they were aware of of how those were used um uh you know i think you know the, this was a you know that i would imagine they would be aware you know but it wasn't happening to them you know this is what's happening to yeah. other people yeah. this isn't so they think they're way beyond that that couldn't happen yeah yeah i, I think you think that if you're if you're one of the garden party overweight bejeweled women of grandeur you may not even take seriously this prophet who uh, may be a fairly prosperous farmer, but he's not, his wife is not a garden bird. Yeah. yeah. You know, I just, it's, it just seems to me that they didn't recognize the prophets and the Nazarenes who were like high order, like monks or abstainers of anything that would distract them from God. So there's nothing left but for God to raise up an oddball prophet, and they and they don't they don't they don't get it. So it's just um, it's very sad, hundreds of years later to read and not compare <laughs> each time that comes along when any kingdom goes awry. It's just. Just hard work. Who is they? Who is they who are taken away with the book? Who is the they? It, it, eventually, it will be the Assyrians yeah. Yeah. that we that we find out. But I think, in just in a larger sense, it's just the calling into account for their for their actions. Yeah. Um, this will happen if you're body power. It's the kind of thing that will happen. Yeah. Well, why do they fish hooks? 
you know, they say they're, they're taking away the hooks. Okay, they even the last of you with fish hooks. I think it's that poetic imagery. Mm -hmm. the, that again? The, 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 this yeah. parallelism. So the first one says hooks, and then the second one says, like, this even worse kind of hook. <laughs> yeah, just to kind of come to, to compound that, you know, again, to evoke that imagery, but also it's that, that, uh, the, that Hebrew poetic style that allows them to, to try and, and evoke a response. Um, but kind of like Mary Jane pointed out, I don't, and, and, and Marianne, I don't think that it even really had any effect on them. Um, telling the real housewives, you're going to get perp walked in handcuffs. You're going to be dragged off in shackles. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, very good, Kathy. <laughs> Absolutely. So you have five minutes. I, I know. Okay. <laughs> well, we did it, so thank you. Thank you. So, um, you know, this this is very harsh judgment from from Amos, um, what he's been called to say, but he's, but there's not there's not an element. Um, it's not without an element of hope. Um, so in chapter five, you know, Amos really kind of to kind of put put the screws in. You know, he's he's saying, here's the bleakness of it, but look, you have an opportunity to do something. Um, and and uh, and again, these are the words of the Lord, chapter five, verse four. For thus says the Lord to the house of Israel, seek me and live. But do not seek Bethel and do not enter into Gilgal or cross over to Beersheba for Gilgal shall surely go into exile and Bethel shall come to nothing. So again, it's that, look, you have all of these spiritual ceremonies um, here in, in chapter five that it goes into to detail about this. Um, you know, they have, they bring their ties every three days. You know, they're, they're totally into worshiping. They're totally into to sacrificing. Um, but essentially, Amos is drawing again this this strong contrast. Look, this isn't enough. I don't just want your lip service. I don't just want these. I don't want your elaborate uh, religious ceremonies. What the Lord desires of you is is your heart and your. Um, your your commitment so seek me and live seek the lord and live um in chapter and verse 14 seek good and not evil that you may live so that the lord god of hosts will be with you hate evil and love good establish justice in the gates it may be that the lord the god of hosts will be gracious to the remnant of, of joseph And then towards the end of the chapter, verse 25, did you bring to me sacrifices and offerings the 40 years in the wilderness, O house of Israel? You shall take up Succoth your king and Kawan your star god, your images which you made for yourselves. Therefore, I will take you into exile beyond Damascus, says the Lord, whose name is the God of hosts. Um, but he gives he's he's giving a, a clear a clear picture just in the verses before that. Alas for you who desire the day of the Lord, um, and and the day of the Lord, I think it, we, we've talked about uh, it's been talked about previously was seen as this it was supposed to be this day of rejoicing and, and great. But the message of Amos is the day of the Lord is a day of judgment. Mm -hmm. um, and so he asked, why do you want the day of the Lord? It is darkness, not light, as if someone fl fled from a lion and was met by a bear or went into the house and rested a hand against the wall and was bitten by a snake. Yeah. Is not the day of the Lord darkness, not light, and gloom with no brightness in it? I hate, I despise your festivals, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the offering of well-being of your fatted animals, I will not look upon. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the melody of your harps, but let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Mm -hmm. And 
that right there is kind of the the crux of the message of Amos. Um, you're doing all of these things, but it's just nothingness because of the attitude of your heart. And and like Cheryl pointed out, let justice roll down. You've taken so much time to build yourselves up from pressing others down, from crushing others. You need to change. Um, so I think at this point, that's where we'll leave Amos here. Um, and we'll pick it up next week. I know I didn't really ch touch on chapter six. It's just kind of more of the same. There's a paper about chapter six. Oh, yes. <laughs> what I wrote about chapter six in my paper. Chapter six discusses more how Israel has fallen short of the expectations that the Lord had for her. Chapter seven. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll pick up on chapter seven through nine next week.